Hey everyone, we're going to be doing pregnancy, preterm labor, and labor meds from CCRI. Okay. So general medication considerations for pregnant and lactating patients. Um, so for most people who are pregnant or lactating, we're going to um, be uh, prescribing a prenatal vitamin, right? So for fetal and maternal health. Um, they need folic acid to prevent neural tube defects and iron to decrease the risk of maternal anemia. Very many pregnant patients come in anemic, and remember, anemia means impaired oxygenation for both mother and fetus. Um, acetaminophen is preferred for mild pain, and the reason why is that NSAIDs uh, may cause early closure of the ductus arteriosus if taken in the last trimester. Um, and aspirin and NSAIDs, more aspirin. NSAIDs, it's kind of controversial whether or not they do, but aspirin in general increases the risk for bleeding, okay? Though, sometimes we give NSAIDs for preventing preterm labor. So indomethacin is a potent uh, prostaglandin inhibitor used short-term for preterm labor. Um, but generally speaking, um, the routine use of NSAIDs, of over-the-counter NSAIDs like ibuprofen um, is not promoted during pregnancy, okay? Uh, and patients should check with their provider and um, also look at the pregnancy category of prescribed medications. So if you're at a facility that specializes like women and infants, for instance, we have clinical pharmacists that that's their area of specialty. So if we have a question about a medication, we ask the pharmacist. All right, pregnancy medication categories. You must know this table. Um, and I don't believe this is in your book. So FDA pregnancy drug classes. So category A means that adequate and well-controlled studies have failed to demonstrate a risk to the fetus in the first trimester of pregnancy, but there's no evidence of risk in later trimesters. B, animal reproduction studies have failed to demonstrate a risk to the fetus, and there's no adequate and well-controlled studies in pregnant women. So, so-so. Mm, C um, means that we, in animals, we've shown an adverse effect of the fetus, but there's no real well-controlled studies in humans, but potential benefits may warrant use of the drug in pregnant women despite potential risks. A lot of medications fall under this category, all right? Category D is that there is, there's definitely positive evidence of fetal risk, but again, the benefits from uh, use in pregnant women may be acceptable despite the risk. For instance, I had a patient who uh, was taking a seizure medication, which was a known category D, but it was the only medication that kept mom from seizing. Of course, we don't want mom to seize and lose her airway and so forth, so she continued to take the medication. And unfortunately, the child did um, have a uh, cleft palate, um, which they repaired, but just so you know, sometimes we still give the medication. And then category X, we know that you know, no matter what, that the use of, um, of the drug in pregnant women clearly outweighs any possible benefit, all right? So if you have a, someone who's on a medication from that category, they would be advised not to get pregnant, period. Okay, so medication management for hyperemesis. So hyperemesis gravidarum um, or morning sickness, which I don't know why we call it morning sickness because there's people, myself included, that it was morning, noon, and night sickness. Okay. Um, first things first, for hyperemesis, we um, always prefer non pharmacologic measures. So, you know, tea, toast, crackers. Um, one of the more common meds we give now is uh, on Dancitron, which is a category B. The most common side effects for that are headache and fatigue. Uh, promethazine, which is a category C, may cause drowsiness. Uh, metoclopramide, which is a category B, causes restlessness and diarrhea. And scopolamine, which is a category C, that's done as a patch. That may be uh, drowsiness, headache, and constipation. Okay, Th those are meds you've already um, been familiar with. Um, if you started with the med surge medications, if not, these are new for you and you need to uh, make sure that you look that up. All right, so tocolytics, when we're trying to stop, oh, my little stop sign doesn't look pretty in this one, but tocolytics, we're trying to stop uterine contractions, right? Uh, so sometimes this happens um, with someone who has not ruptured their membrane, so they, they um, still have an intact amniotic sac, but they're having early contractions. So 
provided everything else is okay, we may try to stop labor and let that kid cook a little longer. The most common one we give is magnesium sulfate. And it's a calcium antagonist and a smooth muscle relaxer. So uh, remember the uterus is a smooth muscle. Um, it is a high risk medication and may cause respiratory depression or arrest. And the antidote is, uh, antidote is calcium gluconate. And yes, you need to know that. Um, the other med we give commonly is terbutaline, which is a beta-2 agonist. So it's a um, beta-2 med, you know, um, it relaxes uterine muscles. And it's also used for uterine tachycystole. And I know you're not currently taking, um, if you're not currently taking Nursing 2050, know that tachycystole is when contractions um, come too quickly or um, don't stop. We don't want to um, have a, a uterine rupture or an, in, uh, an infant in distress. So if contractions are coming too often, we may give to butylene, okay? And this is short term. We're not going to give this as a long term therapy. This is just to stop the contractions. All right, so corticosteroid therapy in preterm labor. So we have a preterm infant with, um, uh, you know, lungs that are not matured yet. So in many cases, they will give beta-methasone or celestone, and that accelerates lung maturation and lung surfactant development in the fetus. So if their gestational age is less than 32 weeks, that, that uh, week's gestation may vary from facility to facility, um, but for our book purposes, we're using 32 weeks gestation. So if they're less than 32 weeks and mom is showing signs of preterm labor and we're worried about early delivery, we would give the um, mom doses of beta-methasone. So what goes to mom, in this case goes to baby, um, it crosses that membrane into the baby circulation and it would promote uh, faster maturation of the lungs. Um, it decreases the incidence and severity of respiratory distress syndrome, which is RDS, increases the survival of preterm inf infants. Um, side effects, they're rare, but they include headaches, seizures, edema, and hypertension. Okay, remember we're giving a steroid to mom and hope that it works on baby. So remember, with, um, without um, surfactant, those um, alveoli aren't going to stay open and that baby isn't going to be able to oxygenate well. So drugs for gestational hypertension. So gestational hypertension is the most common serious complication of pregnancy. It still kills people every year. Uh, Preeclampsia is gestational hypertension with proteinuria, meaning they have protein in your urine. You're not supposed to have protein in your urine. That means your kidneys are taking a hit from the high blood pressure, okay? Um, and then a severe sequela of preeclampsia is known as HELP syndrome, and that's um, defined by hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. This is very, very rare, okay? So what happens is the blood um, pressure is so high that it causes hemolysis, which is um, we're literally popping all our red blood cells because the blood pressure is so high. The liver is taking a pounding from this high blood pressure and causing um, some damage. And we're also losing platelets, okay? This is rare, all right? But it is a severe complication of preeclampsia. And then eclampsia is actually new uh, onset tonic-clonic seizures in a patient with preeclampsia. So we're gonna start with, you know, uh, there's no green here. Gestational hypertension is bad. Oops, D ignore the spelling mistake in that. that so gestational hypertension is bad. Preeclampsia is way worse. And then eclampsia is definitely life-threatening. Okay. So treatment for preeclampsia and eclampsia. Cure. The only d cure is delivery of the baby. That's it. We think it's some kind of miscommunication between mom and her placenta, and it causes this negative feedback loop, which causes higher and higher blood pressures. That's what we think happens. Well, the only way to get that is to get the placenta out of the body, so we got to deliver the baby with it. Or medication management. If, we, if it's mild enough, we may be able to give meds to let that kid cook a little longer, okay? So we want to lower the blood pressure and prevent seizures. The main medication we give for a patient in preeclampsia is magnesium sulfate, all right? We may also administer labetalol or hydralazine for severe range blood pressures, all right? If they're seizing, if, they, if they're already seizing, we're gonna treat the blood pressure and the seizure at the same time. 
So lorazepam for an active seizure, and then we would give the patient magnesium sulfate before delivery, um, and we may continue that after delivery. All right, and we would make sure that this person, person. So if we have someone in with preeclampsia, we want to make sure that they are on seizure precautions during treatment, right? So if they're at risk for seizure, we want to put them on seizure precautions, which means patting the bed and making sure we have suction and oxygen available in the room. So nursing interventions during magnesium sulfate or a tocolytic therapy or for treatment of gestational hypertension, again, sorry about the mis gestational HTN, or GHTN, um, maternal and fetal assessment. So we want to make sure mom and baby are tolerating this well. So the mom may, if the mom's still pregnant, she may be on a, a continuous monitor. Um, we want to assess deep tendon reflexes. So it, a sign of preeclampsia is super duper um, responsive um, deep tendon reflexes. So when we do, you know, check their patellar reflex, they're like kicking really, really high. Um, that's a sign of um, some, to you know, some toxic effects going on within their central nervous system. Um, when we give the magnesium sulfate, the opposite happens. So a sign of magnesium toxicity would be absent deep tendon reflexes. So we're assessing their deep tendon reflexes while they're on magnesium sulfate, and it's done as a continuous infusion. We want to assess pain and uterine contractions as well. So we want to monitor serum magnesium levels as ordered. So we know that a, a magnesium, a normal magnesium is probably around two, right? But we want a therapeutic level. So we get, we're uh, augmenting, we're giving them extra magnesium. So a therapeutic magnesium level for someone who's receiving mag sulfate is four to seven milligrams per deciliter. So we know we're giving them way too much mag, but we're doing that on purpose, all right? We wanna make sure we have calcium gluconate available um, as an antidote, just in case, all right? So, and we wanna observe the newborn for 24 to 48 hours um, because the baby would also have a higher magnesium level, right? Uh, so again, the, met, the therapeutic level is four to seven. Signs of met, severe mag to toxicity include uh, respiratory distress. So we wanna make sure that we're assessing those deep tendon reflexes. And if the patient doesn't have them, so we go to assess their patellar reflex and we get nothing, then that may be an indicator that they're toxic and we should get a serum magne magnesium level drawn. And if it's higher than seven and the patient is showing you know, signs of toxicity, we would slow down the infusion or stop, okay? So, a patient has a serum magnesium level of 10 milligrams per deci deciliter. The nurse anticipates administration of up oh, calcium gluconate, which is our antidote, okay? All right, so pain control and labor, right? So, you know, ideally they're all doing this without pain meds, but come on, who does that anymore, right? Unless you're stuck on an elevator or something. Um, there's hypnotics and sedatives, so promethazine, which is phenergan, um, or um, opiates, fentanyl and morphine. Um, we also have something called a mixed opioid agonist antagonist, which is statol, and then anesthesia. So we can do local, regional, or spinal or epidural. So we can do all... Um, you know, and the reasons for using them um, differ. So for instance, if we give mom a centrally acting uh, opiate like morphine, right? Um, that's going to cross over into the baby and baby could be at risk for respiratory distress at birth. So that's why we tend, um, we'll, we may go for a spinal or epidural, which is still using an opiate, but the medication is only delivered to mom through um, her spinal or epidural space. It's less likely to affect the infant. So, spinal versus epidural. So spinal is one injection at higher doses and it's in the spinal, right? It's in the spine, spinal fluid. Uh, it takes hours to reverse, okay? So that's a one-time dose. So mom's having a C-section, for instance. They would do a one shot into her, uh, into her spine and then um, she's, she becomes completely paralyzed in her lower extremities and can't feel anything other than pressure. Um, sometimes we give a patient at the same time within that spinal something called Duramorph, which is an extended release 
um, morphine, which in addition to uh, allowing them to have their surgery, it also, once they're, they're able to feel everything, it gives them uh, pain relief for 24 hours post-delivery. An epidural is continuous infusion at a lower dose, but it's in the epidural space, okay? So for both of those, we can use things uh, like uh, anesthetics like bupivacaine and opiates such as fentanyl and Duramorph. The biggest side effect for both is hypotension. Let me say that again. Hypotension is the biggest side effect. And we will often um, make sure that a patient has had at least a liter bolus of IV fluid before we even attempt a spinal or an epidural. Okay. Adverse reactions. Well, if we, um, when the physician is putting in the needle, there is some leakage of spinal fluid and we can have hypo, uh, spinal headaches. So if there isn't enough fluid in the, um, we took out too much fluid, you could have something called a spinal headache. Um, there's also risk for respiratory arrest if the um, medication goes too high and uh, paralyzes the muscles of breathing. And you are putting a needle into the spinal area and you can have a spinal cord injury. So nursing interventions. So um, for epidural spinal is make sure that they receive their IV bolus prior to administration. Hypotension is a common side effect. They call it the epi drop for a reason, okay? Uh, assess for level of analgesia. So um, where, how high up is this uh, epi or uh, spinal going? We wanna assess for bladder distension. Um, and sometimes we have to do an indwelling or a straight cath, okay? Um, we also want to assess for hypotension and respiratory depression and have emergency equipment on hand. Um, you're not going to do an epidural on the floor. You know, this is done in a controlled area such as the labor room or PACU or so forth. And we want to assess motor status prior to ambulating. So they, we, even with an epidural, there's some, some um, motor impairment. Um, for spinal, they're going to be completely paralyzed. So obviously we need to assess before we get them up the first time. So drugs enhancing uterine muscle contractility. So we have someone who's in labor and we want to augment that. So there's uterotropic drugs. So oxytocin um, is the most common one that, one that we use. There's also ergot alkaloids and some prostaglandins. So for someone who's got a healthy pregnancy and we, um, they're uh, in labor, we would uh, augment with oxytocin, okay? Um, then there's also mechanical methods for labor induction. There's a Foley catheter and an undilated, undilated cervix or um, extra amniotic saline infusion or membrane stripping, amniotomy. That's all the stuff you're going to learn in Nursing 2050. Um, there's also prostaglandins. So dinoprostone cervical gel or um, uh, the prep prepidil gel, um, or there's the dinoprostone vaginal inserts, a cervidil. So sometimes we want to ripen the cervix so that we have someone who's post-states, maybe 42 weeks gestation, and uh, that kid's not uh, in any hurry to come out. We may ripen the cervix by putting in a prostaglandin into the cervical area, okay? So oxytocin, uh, PIT, right? Um, the dose that we give for someone who has a baby in their uterus to augment labor is very, very different than the amount of medication we give to someone who has delivered a baby and we're trying to stop uh, postpartum hemorrhage. All right, so we're going to talk about postpartum hemorrhage at another time, but I want you to know low, 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 low doses. We're not giving a lot of dose, a lot of this medication to someone with a passenger on board. Right, there is a baby we need to take into consideration. So labor augmentation. So a patient is contracting too infrequently or too weak, the contractions are too weak to make cervical changes. We add oxytocin to improve quality and timing. Maximum dose is 40 milli units per minute before delivery, all right? We also use it after delivery for prevention and treatment of uterine acne, i.e. the uterus doesn't clamp back down after delivery and they're bleeding. Okay, very different doses. All right, so nowadays we have smart pumps, which is a smarter way to infuse oxytocin. Okay, so let's do the math. The, me the, um, the standard dose now is oxytocin, 30 units in a 500 milliliter bag. 
when you realize the brilliance of this uh, concentration, you'll see why um, that this is um, the newest uh, concentration. This is a high risk med and it is titrated on the patient response. So if you have a nurse titrating oxytocin on a laboring patient, that is a one-on-one. -on -one. This is so, uh, everyone's body reacts differently, okay? So usually the physician will start the patient low dose, low. You can't take it back once it's in. So one milli unit per minute, and then the nurse will titrate the infusion over a set period of time, maybe every 30 minutes. Every hospital have it its own protocol until the frequency and quality of contractions are acceptable. So let's look at the, the uh, final concentration. So we have 30 units over 500 milliliters equals 0 0.06 units per one milliliter or 60 milli units per one milliliter, okay? So if you want to administer one milli unit per minute, how many milli units is that per hour? So simple. Um, so multiply by 60 because there's 60 minutes in every hour, right? So to start, you would begin with 60 milli units per hour. And we know that there's 60 milli units per one ml. So you set the pump. So how do we set this? So 60 milli units per hour times one milliliter per 60 milli units equals one milliliter per hour. So when, that's why this concentration is done because if you want one milli unit per minute, the setting on the pump is one milli, milliliter per hour. It's brilliant. It's so incredibly easy. So if you have this concentration, for instance, so my order is for one milli unit per minute, you'll see the rate on my pump says one milliliter per hour. Pretty cool, right? Let's say we're titrating and now we're gonna change the dose to two milli units per minute. Guess what? The rate is now two milliliters per hour. Easy peasy. So if you see this math on your exam, then you should know the answer right away. As long as the uh, concentration is the same, 30 units per 500 milliliters. Okay. So treatment for uterine atony or postpartum hemorrhage. So if, uh, after a woman delivers a baby and the uter uh, and the placenta detaches, it leaves a big boo boo inside the uterus, and the, the uterus needs to clamp down on itself to apply pressure. And if that doesn't happen, we can have uh, postpartum hemorrhage. We always start with fundal massage. So we want to massage the uterus and make it uh, clamp down on itself. We also want to empty their bladder because the bladder is right next to the uterus. And if you have a really full bladder, then it can impair the ability of the uterus to clamp down. Two, we would start with oxytocin, a high dose. Remember the dose we give for um, someone with a baby on board is very different than what we give after delivery. So once the baby's out, all you know holds her off and we can give high doses of oxytocin. Three, we may be give, give them something called methogen or hemabate um, or misoprostol. Those are all medications that are going to cause uterine contractions. Again, we want that uterus to clamp down on itself. Um, with hemabate, hemabate we want to avoid that um, particularly with patients with asthma. And then if one through three fail, then we would do surgical interventions. We may take them to the OR and do a DNC, or we would do a uh, tamponade balloon. So and, um, it's putting pressure from the inside. Um, so we put a balloon filled with fluid inside the uterus to stop the bleeding. Okay. A post-term patient is to be induced into labor. The nurse would expect which agent to be used in this induction. Well, pretty easy, oxytocin, right? The first drug of choice for an induction would be oxytocin. 